think we're running just a few minutes late because the lunch was late and we have a lot to talk about. So we will begin. And welcome to the future of reproductive rights, such as it may be. We shall see. Um, I'm Linda Greenhouse. I'm the moderator. And before I introduce our panelists, who I'm very happy to be at this table with, I have to go through this little drill. So uh, turn off your cell phones, including <laughs> us. If audience members would like to tweet, the Twitter handle is at ACSLaw, and the hashtag is ACS2017. And if you look at the bios, um, you'll see that they give me a hashtag or whatever it's called, handle. And I'm actually, I'm not on Twitter, so I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, if you're claiming CLE credit, um, you have to sign in with the staff at the table. Then uh, we will stop about 25 minutes before 4 o'clock, which is our ending time. Uh, there's a mic in the middle, and we will invite audience questions, questions, emphasizing that with a question mark at the end, and, um, and you will speak into the mic. So uh, <clears throat> before I introduce our panelists, maybe I'll just do a little bit of landscape and where we are today. So it was almost a year ago that the Supreme Court decided the whole women's health case. Uh, a much underappreciated case, I think, because Justice Breyer's majority opinion was so low-key, so unrhetorical. There was really no kind of soundbite that came away from it, but for anybody who read it, uh, they would have seen that this was where evidence-based law met evidence-based medicine in declaring unconstitutional the TRAP laws, TRAP standing for targeted regulation of abortion providers, uh, that the Texas legislature had enacted in requiring, as you recall from this case, requiring uh, doctors to have admitting privileges at local hospitals and abortion clinics to be fitted out or retrofitted as mini hospitals. And what the Supreme Court said was uh, to the state, state of Texas, you're claiming that <clears throat> this is all for the purpose of protecting women's health. Protecting women's health is indeed a valid purpose for regulating abortion, but actually uh, there is uh, no health benefit from this. In fact, there's a health deficit in destroying the infrastructure of uh, the provision of abortions in the state of Texas, and consequently, <clears throat> it's an undue burden. So that was a very important case that had to do with uh, what the courts should do in assessing, evaluating, skeptically, uh, health-related claims. It left, obviously, a lot of questions unanswered, uh, such as questions about uh, abortion restrictions that are being imposed by many Republican-dominated states that deal not, that claim not to be protecting women's health, but to be protecting uh, the fetus. So, uh, and you'll hear this from, from the panelists, uh, things like uh, requirements about what to do with fetal remains from abortions uh, in the state of Texas, which actually has no requirements about what to do with the remains of actual born people, but they've singled out fetuses. Uh, that kind of thing um, we see from what's been leaked from the Trump administration, uh, not only the <clears throat> basically functionally overturning of the contraception mandate that was litigated in the uh, Little Sisters of the Poor case last year, but expanding the exceptions uh, so that employers who claim not only religious-based um, dislike of birth control uh, can get exceptions if they simply don't like birth control for any, you know, any old reason, as I understand it. Uh, that's one. We've seen the great expansion of the global gag rule uh, that cuts off federal funds to um, uh, NGOs working overseas, uh, serving many, many women, um, if they so much as mention uh, or refer for abortion, even if they've never actually provided abortion. So there's a great deal of uh, uh, man, many, many problems, uh, and let alone the future of the Supreme Court. The vote in Whole Women's Health was five to three, 
had Justice Scalia been alive, uh, the vote would have been five to four. Uh, if Justice Kennedy were no longer on the Supreme Court, I'll let you figure out uh, the future of abortion. So with that, <clears throat> uh, the way we're gonna organize this, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to just talk for a minute or two of a sound bite and tell us what it is that they're actually going to plunge into uh, on their second round so that we all know, all the panelists know, and the audience knows um, what people are gonna focus on. And then everybody, each of the panelists will get a chance to dig in a little bit uh, deeper to their subjects. So starting from my um, immediate left is Jacqueline Ayers. I'm gonna be very brief with these because all the bios are in, the, in your program. Uh, who's Director of Legislative Affairs for Planned Parenthood. Uh, to her left is Elizabeth Price Foley, who's a professor of law at Florida International University College of Law and also uh, a lawyer at Baker Hostetler here in DC. Uh, to her left is Julie Reichelman, who's litigation director for the Center for Reproductive Rights that's handled a, a, a lot of the major cases. Uh, and to her left is my colleague from Yale Law School, uh, Reva Siegel, who's the Nicholas Katzenbach Professor of Law at Yale Law School. So you see um, ACS has put together a panel of people who come at this issue from many different vantage points from um, advocacy, from litigation, and from scholarship. So we're really very fortunate to have these people here. And I'm gonna start from the far end of the table and ask uh, Reva to lead off with her main talking points. Okay, so can people hear me? Um, so I'm going to do my minute or two describing um, an argument that I'm going to be talking about rather than a case. And um, before I even start, I want to say that um, we're greatly fortunate as law professors to be in dialogue with wonderful law students. And Rachel Frank, who's sitting out in the audience here, um, was continuously in dialogue with me in the development of this argument. And I wanted to acknowledge her wonderful presence and thank her. Um, so I'm going to be talking about something called a pro-choice life argument. <laughs> Um, the basic idea is that um, when we talk about abortion, we're often in a single issue silo. And um, uh, I am interested in expanding the frame in the way that we talk about the question. In talking about this, I'm going to be talking about something that has relevance, as I was just discussing uh, with Julie for litigation context, but um, in light of our larger circumstances, my aim is to think about arguments that happen as much outside of courts as inside of courts, in politics as well as uh, in law. Um, and the basic uh, idea is that we would expand the relevant bodies of law that are uh, helpful in um, protecting life and reducing incentives to abortion to include you know, sex ed, contraception, um, health care, uh, work-life law, the large range of policy options available to a state, to note that some of these forms of law restrict women's agencies and other forms of law support women in their reproductive choices, and then to begin to pay attention to the ways in which uh, state actors choose amongst these different ways of protecting life. And I will just say that the goals of doing this, this is my last <laughs> seconds here, the goals of expanding the frame in this way, one, it allows pro-choice folks to pay attention to their already existing commitments to life and enlist that in the larger conversation about what it means to defend life and choice, the ways in which they're consistent and not always at odds with each other. Two, it enables critique. Uh, it enables one to point out selectivity and inconsistency in the way that anti-abortion jurisdictions vindicate their supposed interest in protecting life and drive up to the surface underlying concerns with sex and property that are shaping the ways in which state policy functions in this area. And thirdly, and perhaps potentially the most importantly, it opens space for conversations, not only about abortion, but also about work-life law, pregnancy discrimination law, healthcare policy, contraception, sex ed, a large range of, converse, uh, of, of policy issues that are all relevant to the question of the ways we can vindicate values of choice in life. Thank you, we're intrigued, and Julie. Okay, so what I wanna talk about is that, as Linda mentioned, it's almost the one year anniversary of Whole Women's Health, and what I would say is that almost one year later, what we're seeing in the courts as litigators is really a battle for the meaning of Whole Women's Health. What was Whole Women's Health about? What kinds of laws does it apply to? And I think m more importantly for jurisprudence generally, what is the role of the courts? Um, what do the courts mean? So 
Whole Woman's Health, as Linda said, concerned two specific restrictions that the state of ta Texas have enacted that were supposedly about protecting women's health. And many of the restrictions that have been passed in abortion in the last few years have been framed that way. That was a concerted effort of the anti-choice movement to say that the laws were actually about making women safer. But the anti-choice movement has pivoted. It started pivoting even before the whole women's health case was decided, but it's really pivoted now. And it's enacting different types of laws at the state level, as Linda was mentioning, laws that now politicians are saying are about protecting fetal life or protecting the dignity of the embryo or the fetus and restricting abortion for that reason. And what we're seeing is that the state lawyers defending these laws are saying that whole women's health doesn't even apply. And they're making literally the same arguments that they made when they were defending the Texas law and defending these laws. Um, and so far, the courts have been rejecting them. But that is really what's going on right now, is whether whole women's health is going to be meaningful in the future, or whether the states can now come up with another trumped up justification for restricting abortion and continue to get away with it by claiming that role, courts have no role to play in evaluating those types of restrictions. Thanks, Elizabeth. OK, so I guess I'm the uh, sort of token conservative slash libertarian on the panel, um, which will be kind of fun for me. Um, and hopefully for you guys too. But I was trying to think um, how to encapsulate in a couple of minutes um, what my message will be. I'm, I, I teach uh, constitutional law, I practice constitutional law, I also happen to teach healthcare law, but my perspective today is really gonna be more from the constitutional law perspective, but it's a perfect audience for that. Um, and I was um, thinking back to Casey, and I started rereading it a couple weeks ago in preparation for this. And you remember the first line of Casey was, liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt? Uh, and I thought, that's perfect, I'm gonna use that. Um, because uh, what I'm really concerned about uh, is the court's evolution uh, in its standards of review for abortion. Uh, cases and actually, I'm, I'm more interested uh, in a broader issue about the the court's sort of evolution, the standard of review in constitutional cases generally. So not just abortion cases, but um, so what I, I'd like to talk about when we get a little bit more time is is to is to focus on that evolution. You start with Roe in '73. Uh, it's absolutely clear that they start with strict scrutiny. Uh, we know what strict scrutiny is as lawyers. We know how to apply it. You know, we know what the how to walk the walk and talk the talk. Did we somebody? have a controversy about that earlier? People are looking around. No, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, did I miss something? Um, and then, uh, you know, we moved to uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey in, what, 92? Uh, and they came up for the first time uh, as a constitutional matter, this uh, sort of sui generis undue burden standard. Uh, but we got comfortable with that uh, after a while with a few cases under our belt. Uh, and then along came Gonzalez versus Carhartt. That uh, was about 2007, if uh, my memory serves me right. Um, and uh, in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, it was, in my view anyway, it was sort of an undue burden uh, plus, uh, is the way I conceptualize it. The plus meaning plus a, a dose of deference uh, to the legislature on issues of health and safety um, when the court thinks it's sort of a close call, right? Uh, and uh, that suggested, of course, after on the other side of Gonzalez versus Carhartt, that the court was going to be more aggressive. It was signaling to the lower courts to be more aggressive in um, uh, upholding some of the abortion regulations, uh, giving this dose of deference to the legislature on some of these health and safety issues. Uh, and then along came Whole Woman's Health uh, just last summer. Uh, and it completely, in my mind, undid that. Uh, in fact, I think of uh, Whole Woman's Health as undue minus, undue burden minus. Uh, they took away the dose of deference. And in fact, uh, what's fascinating to me is not only did they take away the dose of deference to the legislature, but then they, at the same time, kind of gave the dose of deference to the district court judge. Um, and I think that's very important. I think that's a signal uh, from this court. I mean, who knows what it will mean uh, if the composition of the court changes going forward, but I think it, um, it was intended to be a signal uh, to the lower courts to um, uh, allow um, uh, more fact-finding on the issue of health and safety and allow the trial judge to uh, make a more discretionary call on that. Um, but, but the interesting thing to me at, at a meta level is not just the, the nitty-gritty of the shifts in standard of review, but what does this say about the court's um, legitimacy? Uh, again, if you're it, that that quote from Casey uh, about you know liberty finds no uh, 
uh, Refuge in the Jurisprudence of Doubt was designed to tell all of us, hey, don't worry, we're, we're changing the standard of review, we're shifting to undue burden from strict scrutiny, but um, stare decisis means something to us and we're not gonna abandon the constitutional right um, uh, to terminate a pregnancy. Um, but I think as the court backs away from strict scrutiny, moves to undue burden, goes to undue burden plus, goes to undue burden minus, it's creating some legitimacy questions uh, in some people's minds. Uh, and I think that's bad whether you're, especially if, frankly, if you're pro-choice. Uh, if you're pro-life, you're just as confused as everybody else. Um, I'm a libertarian, so take from that what you may. Um, but uh, I don't think this is, this is good. I think we need some stability uh, in the standard and the way the court articulates it. And I think if you're pro-choice, you should want that. Uh, whether we have that stability, I think, is worth debating, and I look forward to that. Jacqueline. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're here ending the week uh, uh, we celebrated over 50 years since uh, Griswold, and so while uh, you're going to hear a lot from the other panelists and some discussion about abortion access from our state legislators and certainly right now from Congress uh, and sort of the work that I do sits at the intersection of uh, policy, law, and, and political uh, attacks on health care. We are in a fight for basic access to contraception still. And contraception access is being attacked at state and, and federal level. Uh, and hopefully we're gonna get into more of the discussion about that. But um, really just for context, I wanna um, sort of lay out the fact that uh, we're gonna hear uh, as we discuss that they purport to say all of their arguments of attacking Planned Parenthood are about abortion, but in truth, uh, as we'll discuss, this is uh, at its heart really about limiting uh, access to preventative healthcare services and, and the uh, fight for making sure that contraception, uh, which has led to women's ability to pursue careers and uh, their education. Uh, we are now as a country at 30 year low in unintended pregnancy rates. The teen pregnancy rate in this country is the lowest that it has ever been. Um, and really it's uh, now becoming increasingly more about uh, what do these political attacks on basic access to uh, contraceptive services and the, and the range of reproductive health care services mean about women's ability to live their full lives and have uh, autonomy over their body and to have dignity. Uh, and uh, when we get into it, I want to uh, bring forward, as I was asked to really make sure that we uh, dig into what it means when we hear the phrase defund Planned Parenthood. And as that phrase is batted about uh, currently now in uh, the debates around health care in the Congress and in states, uh, what it actually means, uh, not just uh, from uh, perhaps uh, the the future of, of, of whatever the health care bill ends up being at the end of the day, um, but really the impact on uh, the reality of, of women who will uh, really be harmed at the end of the day by all of these state and, and federal attacks, and they're not just attacks on abortion. It is at its basic core um, the ability to, to continue pursuing uh, health care services, and nine, over 90 percent of women at some point in their reproductive lives will have used access to contraception, um, but uh, that is uh, the attack, in fact, that the, the Congress and state legislators are going after. Um, and. They are using language about abortion and language about uh, Planned Parenthood and misinformation about uh, those issues uh, really to try to confuse the matter. And I want to uh, spend the time that we uh, have together digging into a little bit more about uh, how we can help unpack some of that uh, and really bring this conversation back to uh, the freedom and dignity of women to access uh, contraception. So your, your emphasis on the role of contraception and reproductive freedom in the life course of women is a good segue back to Reva's uh, proposal for talking about pro-choice life. Reva and I have done a lot of uh, writing together, uh, and one phrase that we've used in recent articles is abortion exceptionalism, by which we mean uh, those laws uh, that single out abortion or single out uh, the providers of abortion for regulation that's not applied to other health services or other um, the uh, health services of equal or, or greater danger or, or, or whatever. And, and I, if I understand Reba's proposal is to get us beyond abortion exceptionalism and to look at uh, reproductive issues and issues that bear on reproductive freedom in a much bigger frame. Right, so, um, so the first thing um, 
I'll, so this is this uh, argument for thinking about uh, uh, protecting life in a larger frame, the pro-choice life frame. And um, uh, so I'm just gonna start with a, a, a concrete example. Um, usually we think about protecting life and we immediately move to the idea that what you need to do is uh, criminally ban abortion. That's the sort of, it's the conventional frame in which we talk. Uh, about um, the question. And yet we know as a practical matter, if you look at Latin America or you look around the world, that um, simply criminally abandoning abortion does not stop abortion. It makes abortion unsafe, it persists. And in fact, it turns out that there's lots of different kinds of law that you can do, you can use if you actually wanted to protect life and providing access to contraception may be a more effective way of achieving that end than um, uh, banning abortion. I'm gonna just uh, read from a, um, a study in Colorado that providing um, long, uh, the LARCs to women in Colorado um, led to a 24% decline in the proportion of births that were high risk, um, and abortion rates fell 34 and 18% respectively amongst women aged 15 to 19 and 20 to 24. So it's just sort of like letting your imagination go a bit and say, you know, if really this is your aim, there's actually lots of tools at your disposal. Um, uh, but here's, here's the rub. <laughs> I'm not now talking about either or. My argument now is not to say, oh, therefore you must give up your opposition to abortion. Supposing your aim is to protect life, why not do both? Nothing about the location of the fetus in utero stops you from doing both. So then comes the question, let's look to see, and here goes the question of consistency, let's look to see what it is that many anti-abortion advocates do along this wider uh, framework. So when we expand the frame, we know that the Trump um, administration is um, mobilizing people to reverse Roe, but uh, it's also about, it's got a draft rule um, on contraception whose aim is basically to uh, authorize employers to not only object on religious but moral grounds and basically obstruct access uh, to uh, contraceptive benefits of, em of their employees. And if you read the document that's out there, it's full of um, both mistrust of contraception and animus towards contraception. Um, or you can think about the bill that went through the House that wanted to cut as, as essential benefits coverage of maternity. Um, so the idea of contraception or delivery or postnatal care. Um, again, you could be opposed to abortion, but why be opposed to a law that required coverage of these benefits? What are these two sets of positions uh, doing together? This kind of inconsistency is not anomalous. It turns out to be more familiar than one would think. So what is it that I do um, in this paper that's uh, uh, coming along here? Um, so what I've done is try to expand the frame, um, pay attention to the fact that some of these policy initiatives are restrict women's agency, others of them support women and their reproductive choices, and then to um, look for ways of um, asking about the policy choices that various jurisdictions are making. Um, what I've done, it's, it's hard to compare both a law and budgetary choices across jurisdictions. And so um, the framework that in the paper that I'm working with, but I'm delighted to hear more proposals, is to look at various ranking systems. Ranking systems that opponents of abortion have put together where they identify certain jurisdictions as especially um, exemplary in their opposition to abortion. Um, the Guttmacher Institute has identified certain jurisdictions as especially supportive in their providing access to contraceptive care. The CDC and other government agencies have made ranking systems. And so I've used these ranking systems to just simply ask, jurisdiction A, you, know, you have an appetite for abortion restrictions, what do you choose on, for example, uh, work-life policy or access to contraception or otherwise? Um, and so I'll just give you a few little um, nuggets here. Um, so we think of Texas as a leader in opposition to abortion restrictions. It ranks 47th among states for meeting the contraceptive needs of poor women in the state, okay, as it's litigating whole women's health or um, the fetal remains. 28% um, of Texas women of childbearing age do not have health insurance. So put aside your opposition to contraception. Let's just go to the health insurance. I mean, there's, in terms of outcome measures, it would be a long story. Um, and Texas has refuted the Medicaid expansion. Is Texas anomalous? 
Of the 10 states that Americans United for Life identifies as most restricting access to abortion in its uh, Defending Life um, um, uh, website, five have refused to expand uh, Medicaid for low-income families, while of the 10 states that AUL ranked as the least abortion restrictive, none have refused the Medicaid expansion. Okay? Um, you could do the similar kinds of comparisons looking at employment protections for pregnant women and new parents. Louisiana is the only uh, Americans United for Life top 10 state to enact a law requiring employers to accommodate pregnant uh, workers, to make reasonable accommodation for pregnant workers. By contrast, five of AUL's uh, bad states, the ones that don't restrict abortion, have pregnant worker fairness acts. None of AUL's top 10 states have laws expanding federal leave beyond the federal standards, while eight of the bottom 10 states do. So what I'm doing by putting these contrasts out there is just alerting us to the fact that when we expand the frame and we start paying attention to this range of policy choices running from sex ed all the way out to health care and, and work life uh, law, uh, we can see that there's lots of ways of both protecting life, supporting choices, and also incentivizing women in making decisions that could result in abortion or not. And then we can ask in what ways and how consistently across context are you vindicating your supposed interest um, in uh, uh, protecting life? Now, um, paying attention to this and looking for consistency across context, we start to discover that there are other values that are playing a role in state choosings. It's not not concern about potential life, but it's also concern about the institution of private property and control of sex that's also in play in explaining these policy choices. And if you start debating these questions, that's going to go directly up to the surface. If I took the time to take the 125-page um, draft um, uh, rule on the contraception issue, they start going on about extramarital sex. And so the family and the question of sex inside and outside of marriage is mattering in the mix alongside concern with life. So the question then becomes, if in fact state policy is in fact a synthesis of concern about life, concern about the institution of private property, meaning an unwillingness to redistribute, and also interest in controlling people's sexual lives, is it worthy of the same deference? Not necessarily. So, and then just to be quick about this, I'll just go back to where I started in terms of the potential utilities of this larger framing of the question. Um, so I identified um, uh, several different goals or um, uh, aims for rethinking or re enlarging the frame on the question. So one of them is simply that um, uh, pro-choice folks could be able to affirm what they already believe and include inside the frame of their own commitments, their own commitments to protecting life. It's not a question of faking something or talking a talk. These are already, as I've been suggesting, already existing commitments, and they deserve to be part of the conversation as opposed to sort of treat it as sort of some other topic when we're having a conversation on these questions. They're relevant both because they're about protecting life, and they're also relevant as tools to reduce the incidence of abortion. Um, two, um, this way of framing the question enables what I'm calling critique, both legal and political. On the legal front, and this loops back to where Linda and I um, had started when we um, framed out the papers that we wrote uh, prior to Whole Women's Health, we talked about the idea of um, abortion exceptionalism, where a jurisdiction uh, claims a general interest, say, in protecting health, but tends to restrict uh, or regulate abortion in ways that it fails to regulate other procedures of equal or greater health risk. That was going on dramatically in the, in the trap law context, dramatically in the admitting privileges litigation. So the, we played this, this analytic out in respect of the, the life, excuse me, the health interest in uh, the whole women's health litigation. This framework allows one also to do the same in respect of the life interest. And I'm not going to take the time to do it, but we could talk a bit, maybe in Q&A, uh, about the Texas fetal remains law and the question of the either, you can either say, the under-inclusivity of the state's interest in fetal remains or its selectivity, um, that why is it focusing on this case, meaning abortion, but not miscarriage, or <laughs> in respect of these remains, but not, not regulating to the same degree, or even at all, uh, human remains. There's, I mean, this is the longer story about Texas law. So it be then becomes a question to sort of interrogate what is the state doing? And when you put it upside against all of the state's outcome measures and policy choices in these other settings, 
it's a very strange thing that um, with both maternal mortality rates and healthcare needs and infant mortality rates and teen pregnancy rates being what they are, that after Whole Woman's Health, this is the direction that the state went, why that choice? So you can do that in respect of litigation, but it's also possible to do it as a political matter in talking about our choices. I had raised um, the question of essential benefits in the House's health care bill. We can also talk about it in respect of pregnancy discrimination law or whether or not jurisdictions adopt pregnant worker fairness acts. I mean, why is it, if you're committed to life, that you wouldn't invest in these settings as well? It is certainly absolutely relevant to women's decision making around abortion to know whether or not they're going to have a job at the end of the day, have resources or otherwise. It's also, um, if you're consistently saying that you're acting in respect of life, this is what it is that you can do to support it. Why choose women's choice it's restricting rather than choice enhancing means? And then the last um, uh, aim that I had suggested for um, uh, reframing in this way, uh, I would call a political, but in the deepest and the sort of ethical sense of the word, namely that we're in a national conversation about the, the, our commitments here. And so long as we talk about abortion in this narrow frame, uh, controlling women becomes the most dramatic way of manifesting uh, af uh, a support for life. If we expand the frame, we can get into a much deeper conversation with people about what it would mean actually to affirm life, choose life, and choose women at the same time, and to do it in ways that make a difference, and it could make a difference in the way that we're talking about abortion, but it also can make a difference in the way that we're making decisions about Medicaid, about health care, about the essential benefits, about contraception, and profoundly about the ways in which we organize our work worlds. So, stop there. Well, wow, I think we could <coughs> spend the rest of the hour talking about that. <laughs> but um, I want to get back to whole women's health and, and uh, litigation strategies going forward. So, Julie, if I understood your, your opening, the real question is, was whole women's health a one-off that was aimed at a specific type of restriction or does it have a broader utility? Um, absolutely. So some of the themes that um, Linda and Reva were talking about, evidence-based law, selectivity, pretext, those were all critical issues in litigating whole women's health. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what we think the decision means by really telling you what was at stake before it was decided. So many of you may know, but some may not, that since 2010, um, the state legislatures around the country had passed over 300 state-level restrictions on the right to abortion. And many of these restrictions were supposedly about protecting women's health and safety. And what we saw as litigators was that in some of the conservative appellate courts, um, what the courts would say is that you had to defer to the legislature, the court didn't really have a role to play in looking at whether the restrictions would really further women's health or not. It was enough if a politician could speculate that the restriction would further women's health. Um, and the Fifth Circuit, in the decision that was ultimately overturned, basically said that as long as a politician could speculate that it would help women's health and a majority of women in the state weren't prevented from getting an abortion, then the restriction was fine. Um, so deference to the legislature was key. Real facts didn't matter. The courts didn't have much of a role to play. And what that meant for the reality of women's lives, if it had stood up in court, was that states could pass pretty much any obstacle, any barrier to abortion access. Um, and most of those obstacles and barriers fall hardest on the poorest women. They could put any of those in place. And unless it was an abortion ban, the courts essentially were supposed to rubber stamp it. So that was what was really at stake in Whole Woman's Health. And the Supreme Court decision um, with Justice Breyer's opinion really rejected every single one of those key points. So first, the court said, um, you don't defer to the legislature. Abortion is a real constitutional right. And for real constitutional rights, courts have a key role to play. And they have to take a close, hard look at the restriction. They have to see if the restriction does what the state claims it does. So for the laws at issue in that case, the claim was that it would protect women's health and safety. As Linda said, actually there was no evidence that it would. In fact, the evidence was that the laws would do the opposite. Um, and again, you had to look at real science, not junk science. The evidence had to pass Daubert and other traditional legal standards. Um, the other thing that 
uh, the court said was the, not only is there no evidence that this is gonna help um, protect women's health, but let's look at, like Riva said, let's look at whether if you're so concerned about health and safety, are you regulating similar medical procedures or more dangerous medical procedures in a similar way? And guess what, Texas wasn't. Um, and so the court was very suspicious of the claim and even though it didn't make a specific finding that the Texas legislature had a bad purpose, a huge part of the opinion was looking at what the state claimed the law would do and what it actually did in order to decide that really without saying it, it was a pretextual law. Um, and then one other thing that is a little bit apart from the law and some of the policy issues we've been talking about, but that's really important for those of us who litigate about abortion issues and that we've been dealing with for years, was the claim of the anti-choice movement that abortion is very dangerous in a variety of ways. And we saw that in case after case after case with absolutely no evidence to support it. And Whole Women's Health just says resoundingly that abortion is an extremely legal abortion in the United States is an extremely safe medical procedure. And there is just no evidence to support the claims of danger that the other side had been making for years. So as I mentioned, really four days after Whole Women's Health was decided, so it was decided on June 27th, on July 1st, the Texas legislature passed a new set of restrictions on the right to abortion. Um, and these were now uh, the restrictions that you've heard mentioned, which require burial or cremation of all embryos or fetuses following an abortion. Um, and the state claimed that this law was about protecting fetal life and fetal dignity, even though, of course, it applies after the abortion has occurred. Um, so the woman has already made her choice to end the pregnancy. And this was just another way to really make it difficult for medical practices in the state, just like the previous laws, to make it difficult for medical practices to offer this healthcare service to women. And now we've seen um, these laws pop up in a number of states. We're also seeing laws that restrict the uh, a very safe method of abortion, so they're starting to ban abortion method by method throughout the states, again, based on claims of fetal life and fetal dignity. Um, and then we're also seeing an extension of waiting period laws. So many states had had laws requiring a 24-hour waiting period before uh, between a woman receiving state-mandated counseling, biased counseling, and being able to get the abortion procedure. And many of those laws also required a two trip to the clinic with 24 hours in between. That wasn't good enough for the states. They're now extending those delays to 72 hours in many places. Um, again, making it, you know, just putting up another barrier, making it even harder for poor women to actually be able to access the care that she needs. And these laws, um, in our view, are really about shaming and demeaning women. And the state is defending, the states are defending them on um, the grounds that they protect potential life. And the arguments that they are making are, as I mentioned, literally exactly the same. The court has no role to play. Um, it should defer to the state legislature's view about what furthers potential life. The court has no expertise in being able to decide whether a law actually furthers potential life or not, just like they were claiming the, law, the courts had no expertise to decide issues of medical uncertainty for the health and safety laws. Um, and most alarming, um, the states are saying things like, literally, you know, harm to a woman is an acceptable trade-off in the state's pursuit of potential life or the dignity of the life of the embryo or fetus. And so we're seeing literally the same arguments, and, and they're saying explicitly, just to be clear, that whole women's health does not apply. The analysis in whole women's health, um, which requires a close look, real evidence, no deference to the legislature and also says that the law has to have benefits that outweigh its burdens. None of that applies to this new set of restrictions. Um, and these laws are being passed around the country. Obviously, if the difference between a law being constitutional and not unconstitutional is just what a politician says about it, um, that's not a workable legal standard. That's not a way to protect a constitutional right. Um, but this is exactly the arguments that they're making and because these laws have now been passed, nearly identical laws have been passed in a variety of jurisdictions. There is no doubt that another circuit split will arise sometime soon and another case will get up to the Supreme Court um, and the court will have to decide what did whole women's health mean? Was it a one-off um, or was it something else? 
Will it change the standard again? Um, or will it respect what it said before? And so these are the issues that we as litigators are facing right now and they're playing out for us in courts um, around the country. So that flows nicely, that flows nicely into Elizabeth's presentation. And just for when you mentioned circuit conflicts, so I'll just to contextualize a little. Of course, there was a circuit conflict uh, at the time that <coughs> Whole Women's Health reached the Supreme Court on cert uh, because Judge Posner for the Seventh Circuit has said, you know, what does undue burden mean? It implies some kind of balance. Undue compared to what? So you compare, you balance the benefit, the actual benefit, evidence-based benefit, and the actual burden placed on access to abortion, and that's why he struck down the uh, Wisconsin trap law that was at, at issue there. What the Fifth Circuit said was, I think this is an exact quote, in our circuit, we do not balance. We simply defer. Elizabeth, over to you. Well, that's a beautiful segue, uh, actually. Um, because, you know, it, it, it may be that whole women's health turns out to be a one-off. Uh, that certainly would not be unusual in abortion jurisprudence. I mean, abortion jurisprudence is sui generis. It's its own creature. When you teach it as a matter of constitutional law, you just have you feel like you have to explain to your students over and over again, abortion's different, put it in a different intellectual box, you know, and just get, run with it. Uh, because it doesn't fit in the normal structure post row. I mean it did in row, right? If you accept the structure row, I mean put trimester framework aside, strict scrutiny, again, we're all comfortable with it. Um, and in fact I think it was was it you, Julie, who who just said, um, you know, abortion is a real right, you know? Um, okay, if it's a real right, uh, uh, treat it like a real right. Uh, yeah, there's more legitimacy in a strict scrutiny framework than creating a special test just for abortion and trying to explain why you created the special test just for abortion. Um, whether the court will ever go back to strict scrutiny, I, I, you know, I, that's above my pay grade. Uh, but um, again, uh, composition of the court matters, certainly, so uh, to be determined. But um, I think right now, if you look at the shift, um, this is why I'm concerned about the court's legitimacy, and not just in abortion, but across its constitutional cases. Um, it, it seems to have whiplash, you know. I mean, you, you, you can really hurt yourself um, watching these cases move back and forth like a, a game of tennis. Uh, I do think there's a substantial difference uh, between Gonzalez and whole woman's health. You know, whether it turns out to be a sustainable difference, I don't know, but uh, you can't reconcile those two cases. I mean, they are, they are different conceptions of the undue burden standard. Uh, the undue burden standard in Gonzalez versus Carhart is, is an undue burden standard that doesn't consider benefits. Uh, it just considers the burdens. Uh, it also is a standard that uh, provides this sort of extra dose of deference to the legislature, uh, and Gonzalez versus Carhart takes all of that away. Um, Gonzalez versus Carhartt, um, you may recall in Casey, for example, this benefit, how do you do the balance, right? Posner concern. Um, what does this undue burden standard mean? Um, uh, and you remember uh, what the way the court explained the definition of undue burden? They said, well, an undue burden is a substantial obstacle <laughs> in the path of a woman's ability to, to choose to terminate your pregnancy. And when you teach that as a constitutional uh, law professor, you, uh, students are like, I'm sorry, come again? Like, what is it? Uh, okay, so uh, an undue burden is a substantial obstacle. Okay, well, what's a substantial obstacle? Well, it's an undue burden, <laughs> right? And you're like a dog chasing your tail. Like, nobody really knows what that means. Um, and then I think once you have this, um, this l taking away of the deference to the legislature, and you add the ability, as you do in Whole Woman's Health, to let the district court judge consider not only the burdens of the law, how much it burdens a woman's uh, access, but also the benefits. Uh, and if you, ever, if you ever do sort of economic theory and you do um, risk benefit burden analysis, you know how hard the benefit part of the analysis is. It's actually harder conceptually than the risk part of the analysis. Um, but so when you throw in the ability of a district court judge to balance only, not only the burdens, but now also the benefits explicitly, um, you are getting into some interesting conceptual territory uh, because you're, you're shifting power, um, and here's the conservative in me, right? You're shifting power away from the legislature, right? The, the people's representative, elected representative, to, to make that balance determination. And you're giving it to one guy or gal in the form of a district court judge. I think that is more troubling to me than anything else. And again, you're talking to someone who, as a matter of raw theory, 
would rather the court be honest and upfront and shift to strict scrutiny than play around with this um, undue burden analysis that gives the trial court judge, I think, too much discretion because think how much we can game this system as litigators, right? And you talk about forum shopping in sentence. Uh, now, I think the entire game as a litigator in this field will be finding the right judge, right? The most important motion you can make in litigation is the motion to the superior power, if you believe in one, to give you the right judge. Um, now that really means everything, I think, in abortion litigation. This open-ended balancing test um, is not very law-like to me. I think it's subject to incredible manipulation. Uh, and it, at least strict scrutiny and rational basis review um, have more meat on the bones. Uh, because think about what strict scrutiny, even intermediate scrutiny, I'm not real fond of that either, but at least strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny, when you, when you learn it in law school, the conception behind it, right, is presumptive unconstitutionality, right? Uh, if you uh, know that a case is going to be uh, facing strict scrutiny, or law is going to be facing strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny, your mindset as the judge and as the litigator is a mindset that this law is probably going down. Strict in theory, fatal in fact. It's probably going down because it's presumptively unconstitutional the minute you walk into that courtroom. That should be the mindset of the judge, it should be the mindset of the litigators, at least we're all on board. And we know who bears the burden of proof and persuasion, all right? It's the government uh, in a strict or intermediate scrutiny case. Rational basis review, it's the opposite of that. It's presumptive constitutionality, right? And everybody's mindset should be the same going in. But with the balancing test, I don't think we have a common language as lawyers and a common mindset. And I think that can be dangerous for litigation. Um, so I, I do think there's something troubling, but it's not just whole woman's health that's troubling to me. It's the undue burden standard itself. But I think it's gotten a little murkier and more problematic under whole woman's health. So Jacqueline, you will do us a favor if you explain to us what is entailed in defunding Planned Parenthood, because in my conversations just with you know friends and neighbors, nobody seems to understand. People seem to have the idea that there's a bucket of federal money that gets sort of poured over into Planned Parenthood's uh, coffers, and, and, and we know that's not actually the case. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so uh, picking up on the last panel's comments about uh, um, the deferring to legislatures, uh, what is going on with the phrase defunding Planned Parenthood is complete dishonesty and politics playing itself out and not full uh, information or science about uh, what in fact it means to say phrases like defund Planned Parenthood. So um, I just want to begin by grounding us in, and I won't go into a ton of detail, but just some facts about uh, the health services that are provided at the nearly 700 health centers across the country by uh, Planned Parenthood affiliates. Um, there are 2.4 million people who receive health care services, and it's a range of uh, reproductive health care services. Um, uh, the population that we serve is uh, primarily uh, on uh, Medicaid. 70% uh, of a Planned Parenthood's patients live at 150% of the federal poverty level. And 84% um, of our uh, population of patients are about age 20 or older. Um, 60% of our patients are on currently on Medicaid, so relying on federally uh, federal funded uh, programs, and um, we provide uh, over 600,000 cancer screenings every year, uh, literally nearly three million birth control information services, um, nearly four million STI testing um, services that are provided every year, and Planned Parenthood is the nation's largest uh, provider of sex in, uh, sex education information, providing it to 1.5 million people. Um, so three percent of the health services that Planned Parenthood health centers provide, of all the things that I just told you, are abortion. So when politicians in the Congress and states enter into uh, their uh, crusade on defunding Planned Parenthood, where we frequently hear they begin the conversation is because we uh, want to protect uh, taxpayer funding from going to abortion. So a good reminder, which way, uh, many may know, um, the way federal funding streams currently are set up, federal funds do not uh, are not allowed to provide 
uh, funding for abortion except in very limited circumstances. Um, that's a policy, obviously, that many of us do not agree with, but it is currently the law, and we follow it uh, as a health care provider. And um, so when the beginning of uh, the uh, premise of why they're going after Planned Parenthood is about the issue of abortion, uh, what they are not saying is that ultimately what this is about is uh, cutting out and cutting back the health care services, um, particularly access to um, a, a, a birth control for some of the lowest income and most vulnerable uh, people who really have nowhere else to go. So um, completely devoid of facts, what we frequently hear um, and have heard in the Congress in the last few years, and I will just note the 114th Congress um, was the most votes that we've ever seen in history on anti-reproductive health care um, legislation, and uh, over nine votes just on the question of defunding Planned Parenthood came before the Congress. Um, not, couldn't find anything else for them to occupy their time, given all of the issues. So they, um, this uh, Congress have entered into with a, a, a real intention behind uh, muddying the waters about the phrase of what it means to defund Planned Parenthood. So we frequently hear um, that when uh, legislatures push forward, and in fact, when a Speaker of the House, uh, Paul Ryan, tweets about this issue um, and, 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 how, and touts the American Health Care Act, the health care bill that passed through the House, um, he, uh, in fact, says defunding Planned Parenthood has to be in the bill because we don't want taxpayer funds from going to abortion. Um, so that's not the fact. So here are the facts. The uh, Planned Parenthood is just like any other healthcare provider, just like a hospital or a private physician that participates in the Medicaid program or a federally qualified health center. Uh, Planned Parenthood uh, gets re provides the healthcare services and is reimbursed uh, to the from the federal government for those services uh, as a Medicaid provider. And uh, what is not true is that uh, we there is no such thing as a line item in the federal budget for Planned Parenthood. There is not a publisher's clearinghouse check that comes to Planned Parenthood every year. Um, it is not a, as we heard the other side frequently say, $400 million of taxpayer funds are going to abortion. Um, both uh, Planned Parenthood uh, uh, health centers around the country participate both in the Medicaid program as well as federal uh, family planning programs and sex education programs. And so just as uh, other providers are subject to uh, applying for those funds from the federal government, having their, um, having their applications reviewed, and uh, then being a qualified participant in those programs, uh, we are exactly the same. Um, we, I, I do want to also say just one other thing about Medicaid, is that the Medicaid program uh, already states that as a recipient of Medicaid, individuals who are low income and on that program can go to any willing provider. So a provider who is meeting all of the requirements of Medicaid, um, and the recipient then decides and chooses to go to a Planned Parenthood, for example. That means that they are, uh, again, compliant with the Medicaid program, and it's working for Planned Parenthood just as it is for every other Medicaid provider. And in fact, one in five women in this country have been to a Planned Parenthood, so many uh, people are choosing uh, as, uh, to use Planned Parenthood as their Medicaid provider. One of the um, arguments that we frequently hear is from the other side is not simply that because Planned Parenthood is a, a, an abortion provider, but also um, that other providers will help meet the need. And uh, we frequently, multiple floor speeches and things that we've heard um, in interviews from those opponents of reproductive health in, in the Congress are that you have community health centers who will provide these same services, so therefore you don't need Planned Parenthood. What the reality looks like in uh, on the ground, and many of you probably come from states where um, community health centers are doing very good work and providing quality services, but are also overburdened and have long waiting times, have are already at capacity, and in fact, um, because the healthcare safety net works very closely together, um, that means that a lot of times a federally qualified health center is deferring their patients to Planned Parenthood. Because if you want to be able to access, um, an, say, a, a LARC or IUD, um, if you want to be able to have an understanding of the uh, full range of FDA-approved methods of contraception, you want to defer that and, and refer to that client to 
a provider who does that every single day, not that it's just one of the services they provide um, in a range of primary care services that they provide. So across the country, we've seen community health uh, uh, center leaders who have come out and said, actually, we are unable to absorb the need uh, in a state like California where there are uh, a million, nearly a million patients providing uh, care through the Planned Parenthood network in that state. The Primary Care Health Association has said, um, we cannot meet the need. And in fact, these patients will go without care. Um, so what we know is that right now, in, as the Senate moves forward in pushing a health care reform uh, bill, uh, that the, the way that the provision has been drafted in the bill is very careful uh, in order to only target Planned Parenthood. And in fact, the Congressional Budget Office in its analysis of the provision uh, that passed the House said that Planned Parenthood would be the only impacted provider and we can talk through Q&A about uh, the criteria in the, in the legislation that does that. Um, but again, because they are uh, really you know, devoid of, of facts and information um, and uh, the, the basic science of just respect for the fact that people are uh, receiving their contraceptive services at a Planned Parenthood, uh, politics are allowed to outweigh all of that and we see legislatures um, going after it. So just one note about other attacks in addition to defund Planned Parenthood, we know that the Congress uh, will continue to uh, go after abortion bans, um, and obviously uh, we do expect this administration who has now put uh, several people very hostile to reproductive health care over health care programs at the Department of Health and Human Services, we do anticipate the rule that was um, discussed uh, is one example. The, the other kinds of things that we think that if we don't see defunding happen in the Congress, they can also do this successfully in the states. And Texas has already put forward um, something called an 1115 waiver, uh, where they're going to seek permission from CMS to uh, provide Medicaid funding to, for family planning as long as Planned Parenthood doesn't participate. So um, in a hostile HHS, we think that that Texas application being approved uh, uh, currently will be uh, a signal to other states to go the same route, so that if the Congress um, sort of can't take us out full with a full sword, we'll We'll see other states follow this same uh, pattern of changing, essentially changing the Medicaid law and changing uh, how they go after uh, um, access. So just one last minute about what we're sort of doing to fight back. Um, we uh, have really been mounting a campaign of people. We think that it really is important um, to build a movement of grassroots voices and uh, Planned Parenthood is over uh, 10 million supporters who we are relying on to call their senators, you all to call your senators. Um, and uh, we are really uh, making sure that there is a movement-led opposition um, to what's happening in the Congress. But we also are very um, cognizant and if our, uh, about uh, how to mitigate the harm of any of the impact that happens. And so um, the way that the provision currently being debated in the Congress is drafted, it is a one-year defund. And so just to put out any kinds of uh, uh, misinformation about that point, which Republicans also uh, usually talk about, a one-year defund would be immediate for Planned Parenthood health centers. Um, it is the only provision in the American Health Care Act that would be um, that uh, would take effect upon enactment. So that means literally the next day, chaos in the health care system where people don't know if they can continue to uh, continue with their appointments at Planned Parenthood. Um, and uh, it, it and and there is no sort of um, there's this assumption out there around will Planned Parenthood will be fine for that year or there will be fundraising efforts to help those uh, women get access to services um, and so just to be really clear you can't sort of fundraise your way out of uh, 430 million dollars from the federal government and Medicaid reimbursements um, and so uh, we are obviously also thinking and our litigation team is. Um, thinking about what would it look like to mitigate the harm through uh, through the court systems um, and uh, very calculating thoughts obviously about where you do that and how that happens. Um, if we uh, uh, see that, uh, we certainly would pursue um, an injunction immediately um, if this is in fact a bill that the president signs and if it m makes it through the Congress, uh, but there are no guarantees with that. So, um, you know, we're doing uh, really, we feel like we're in the fight of our lives right now in this moment. Uh, as the Congress debates this, and um, and we really want to uh, sort of pull this back from the politics and continue talking about the people and the patients who would be impacted if their health care uh, is removed in this way. I can't believe how quickly the time has gone on this panel, and I've promised to uh, 
leave time for questions, um, if there are any. If not, I'd be really interested in people responding to Reva's proposal. Um, so take a couple of questions. Yeah, and please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Joanna Scavoni. I'm an attorney in San Diego um, and a proud Planned Parenthood supporter and donor. And I have a question, sort of if I'm explaining this to my friends, I just want to understand, and Jacqueline, have you tell me if this is an accurate way to do it. Um, so my sister is here, and let's say she has private insurance, and she goes to her health care provider, and she gets her annual visit, and she gets her cancer screening, and she gets her contraceptive prescriptions, and then they bill her plan, and she they, it gets paid back, right? And let's say I'm on Medicaid because I'm low income, and I go to Planned Parenthood, and I do the exact same thing. So basically, the bill is targeted at just not paying you because Medicaid is my insurance. Is that right? That's correct. Right, it's discriminatory, it's intentionally against so that seems women to me, who rely on the Medicaid program. It seems to me yeah. like a way that is a very clear illustration to, as we discuss this with our friends and neighbors, that makes it really concrete about the difference and the lines that they've drawn about women who access this through Planned Parenthood versus private insurers. Well, if I, if I could elaborate, tell me if I'm right. So if you as a Medicaid patient chose not to go to Planned Parenthood, but to the doctor down the street who was a Medicaid provider, that would be exactly the same. I mean, they're all in the same boat, so the issue is whether to carve Planned Parenthood out of a generally provided uh, Medicaid service. Right. Except you'd, you'd wait weeks to get into that private provider, whereas Planned Parenthood gets into you in a couple of days. Right. Yes. Hi, my name's Ellie. I'm a law student at uh, University of Connecticut. So this is a little out of the scope of what we talked about, but ties a lot into the misinformation um, with the Hyde and Helm Amendment and the global gag order. So thinking about how this misinformation of not paying for abortion overseas, which is already banned, um, being used to further the global gag order is one thing I'm thinking about. Um, but the real thing I'm thinking about is Agency International and Russ versus Sullivan, where this government can't um, govern speech that it's not paying for. But that's for uh, American institutions. So with the global gag order, it seems it would be unconstitutional, uh, the scope of it, but they don't, they don't have constitutional rights for um, foreign groups. So I've been sort of struggling with where that would be addressed if, if it's not covered with constitutional, if we are um, trying to address that sort of loophole if that would have to be something done by Congress or international sphere, I don't know who's best to answer that, but I've been thinking about that a lot. Maybe that's a question for Julie, but I'll just say, I mean, I've been waiting for somebody to file a First Amendment challenge to the yeah. global gag rule because although these uh, NGOs do work overseas, a lot of them are US based. Mm -hmm. uh, so under the John Roberts opinion in that open society case mm -hmm. from a couple, years ago, uh, which struck down a restriction on um, State Department AID money uh, going to NGOs. Uh, uh, if the NGO did not include in its grant making a statement that it opposed uh, the sex trade, uh, it wouldn't get federal money. And the claim of these uh, recipients was uh, there are situations where you want sex workers to be, um, not to be scared off from coming in and getting services. And so they objected to the statement of their mission uh, imposed by the federal government and the court accepted that argument as a First Amendment claim. So I'm not sure why there hasn't been similar litigation over the ramped up global gag rule. I can say that folks are definitely thinking about the issues, and Reva was just saying to me, which I agree, it's you know both the First Amendment claim, obviously a little bit different than in that case, but that's a key case, but it also gets wrapped up with the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, which I'm not sure if anybody <laughs> understands, but it's extremely complicated. Um, another area that perhaps could have greater clarity. So uh, there are a number of groups working together to think through these issues, though, so that you may be hearing more about that soon. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Allison Smealy. I go to Temple Law School in Philadelphia. Want to uh, talk a little closer into the mic? Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, we recently had a discussion about the leaked um, Trump administration draft, um, and, and it seems to reflect a hierarchy of identities that's respected in the United States where religion 
trumps um, the ability of an individual woman to kind of choose what she wants to do. Um, and I was wondering if this hierarchy is um, rooted in anything? Is it rooted in constitutional law? Is that something um, that we can combat politically and legally? So I'm just interested in your different perspectives. Thank you. Well, well I mean, uh, from my perspective, there is no hierarchy of constitutional law. If it's uh, in the Bill of Rights, it's in the Bill of Rights or any other provision of the Constitution. Um, that's why, frankly, I don't, I, I, I even have conceptual problems um, with Caroline Products footnote four. Um, which is the genesis of, of the three basic tiers of scrutiny that we have. I mean, I think that that is around the margins, not itself, cons you know, at least as a matter of theory, defendable. Um, but, um, I mean, let me just say that uh, when it comes to this new draft rule, um, and that, that hasn't been published yet. No. It's no. still just being secretly circulated to the press. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I have I have two minds on this one. I mean, look, uh, this was a regulation ab initio uh, by the Obama administration. It was their interpretation of uh, the ACA's demand for coverage of pre preventative care, uh, and they classified contraceptive as a preventative service in their regulations. Um, so, like any regulation, it can be undone. Um, so, if if that's what the Trump administration wants to do as a matter of policy and prioritize. Uh, free exercise of religion through its revised regulation, I guess, bully for them. Um, that's the way the political process works and, and, and you know, elections have consequences. Um, but uh, in terms of there being some conceptual basis why the freedom, uh, the free exercise clause would get hierarchical, you know, priority over something else, uh, certainly hope not. We do, um, on a variety of circumstances, treat religion as having a special status. Um, <clears throat> a striking feature about the draft rule that's circulating is that it's not making an exception only for religious objectors. It's going beyond a RIFRA frame. It's saying um, religious or moral objections. And in doing so, it's going busting out way beyond anything like the Hobby Lobby framework. It's basically saying, if your employer doesn't agree <laughs> with uh, the employees getting benefits, then the employer can object. It's not clear, actually. There's a, a very interesting, I, I'm not going to take a lot of time. I'll just simply, well, there's a, a couple of posts on the Take Care uh, site, both on the substance of the draft rule. Uh, Doug Najame and I posted one there, and um, uh, Nelson's got one. And then there's several APA ones as well, uh, Nicholas Bagley and a few others. So you can also ask yourself, is there actually a regulatory basis for the way in which the administration is proceeding? There's a lot of objections on that ground as well. The main thing that you should know is that there's, it's not as if um, I have an objection to expanding conscience objections beyond religion to include ethical objections. But if you have an objection of that sort and there's no third party limits, this has consequences for employees. And even what the court upheld in Hobby Lobby and Zubik assumed that there was still a way of employees to get their access to health insurance coverage by some other means. That was the commitment of the Obama administration. It is not the commitment of the Trump-Pence administration. If you read the 125-page document that's posted, it is, as I suggested earlier, uh, full of animus, it sort of suggests that contraception doesn't work, and then it also suggests it facilitates extramarital se teen sexuality, and it's basically expressing a general hostility to contraception and not simply a commitment to respecting conscience. So what's going on here is a sort of indirect, and um, I invite you to take a look at the, the post that I have up, which links to a bunch of sources, both on the skepticism on contraception, also, and importantly, the way in which this form of objection is being modeled to reach out to uh, LGBT issues as well. It's the same sort of thing that's happening uh, in North Carolina, and, and, and so you'll sort of see those links played out. Can I just jump in there, too? I, I would just say that, um, you know, if, if the Trump administration wants to expand it to, to moral objections, again, that's a policy choice. They can certainly do so. There's nothing... There's no constitutional overlay here. Uh, this is a regulation ab initio, but it's not clear that there's a statutory basis for their cutting that exemption in the in the statute. Well, they can undo. They can undo the regulation. But they haven't. Is the point right? But the point is that they can. They can certainly use whatever 
APA, uh, that's another But they question. also haven't done notice and comment. Well, but the, the, the initial piece. rule itself was an interim final rule. So there's a question about whether you can undo an interim final rule with another I agree. interim final rule. This is what's going to be right. litigated. <laughs> right. That's where, that's where the legal action is, not at the constitutional level. I think it's APA type yes, objection. Yes, I agree. Right. Um, I'm a native Texan, and my grandma actually started an abortion clinic in Houston that's still open, thanks to the whole and health decision, so thank you for all that. Um, but um, one thing that I've, I volunteer with an organization in Texas that helps um, minors uh, acquire judicial bypasses, the parental consent law, and I was dismayed when I uh, found out I'd be starting law school in Massachusetts that they also have a parental consent law. Um, I would expect that from Texas, but not from Massachusetts, because yeah, I'm quite familiar with- That was Bilotti against Baird, right? Uh, I, yeah, I yeah. guess so. And um, so I'm curious to, uh, to hear more about parental consent laws, if there are judicial or legislative strategies to, uh, you know, any, any efforts to uh, help get rid of them. <laughs> Yeah, I read online uh, just yesterday that I think Louisiana has either passed or is about to pass a law that basically requires uh, not only parental consent, but the parents have to show up and get the counseling or have to file some kind of affidavit that it added many layers uh, uh, to this. So, um, you know, the court, the Supreme Court has been fairly, um, I mean, even the, old, the older court, uh, fairly indulgent about these uh, parental consent with bypass. There has to be a bypass, and it's relied on. Uh, so, so the structure has come down to rely on uh, judges to realize that if a minor is desperate enough and afraid enough of notifying her parents and has her act together enough to find her way to court. Uh, then the abortion is either in her best interest or she's mature enough to decide that for herself. Um, when George W. Bush was running for president, a uh, statistic came out that judges appointed by him in the state courts of Texas were actually denying bypass requests at um, a shockingly high level, whereas in many states there you know, if the minor can find her way to a judge, the judge will say yes. Uh, so it really comes down to a very local um, issue. It really ma ma makes a difference who the judges are. Yeah, the, the one thing I'll just add to that is, as Linda said, in terms of federal constitutional law, that it was essentially lost um, a number of years ago where the court said that a parental notice or consent law with a bypass was constitutional under federal law. But one thing we haven't talked about is, as litigators, we also rely on state constitutions. And there's a number of state constitutions that are actually more protective um, of various rights, including reproductive rights, than federal law has been recently. And in terms of the importance of the standard, in the jurisdictions that have kept a strict scrutiny framework for the right to abortion and who have actually held a trial and looked at the evidence, they've struck down these laws. And they've struck them down because when you actually get down and see what these laws do along the lines of what Linda was saying, the minors who have a good enough relationship with their parents, they tell their parents anyway. So the minors who feel that they cannot tell their parents because their family situation is such that it could really put them in harm's way, they're being forced to then navigate a system to get themselves to court. So you know, the minors in sometimes the most vulnerable situations are being forced to find their way to court and get a bypass. Um, and so the system doesn't make a great deal of sense. Good afternoon. Uh, regarding- uh, well, who, who are you? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Dan Mandel. <laughs> uh, and my question is in part because I'm not a lawyer, I'm a historian. So pardon my perhaps ignorance in my question. But I'm wondering, there's the Hobby Lobby doctrine and the proposed uh, regulation that is still out there somewhere from the Trump administration. At what point do the supposed RIFRA um, privileges given to employers clash with the RIF RIFRA privileges of employees? At what point can employees, speaking perhaps hypothetically, say, wait a second, our religious rights are being violated by our employers? is my question. Riva. Well, um, there are, uh, I was going to say that the employers are bringing um, suit under 
the federal law challenging the federal statute, but it's probably equally described as various groups are encouraging certain employers to bring suit under the federal law. Um, and so what they're doing is they're getting exemptions from or accommodations from obligations that federal law is imposing on them as employers. And the question about the um, interests of the employees depends on the way in which um, those who are uh, recognizing the religious exemptions um, proceed, whether they take the third party impact of the exemptions into account. When the Obama administration made some accommodations and exemptions for religious employers, um, it took employee interests into account. When the courts faced this question, it's interesting, um, in the 10th Circuit, as best I understood it, um, Justice Gorsuch's opinion didn't uh, make this move, but by the time it got into uh, the Supreme Court, uh, when the Supreme Court dealt with the question, it said that uh, the exemption would lie because there were other ways of getting access to the, um, providing, covering the employees. We're now in a world in which um, the current administration is not committed <laughs> to making sure that these offsets and protections are available. And the question then will become, um, either in terms of the current administration or um, the current or future Supreme Court, whether it proceeds in a way that takes uh, interests of third parties into effect. And I, I should say that these are questions um, not just of RIFRA law. It doesn't matter if you're um, an historian or anyone else. There's a point to recognizing people's conscience and religious objections, but there's not much of a point in doing so in a way that makes somebody else who doesn't share the belief pay the price of it or bear the burden of it. That's something like fundamental fairness. Now there are people who can find this principle in our establishment clause and free exercise law as a constitutional norm, and we could talk about case law, but I think it also just sounds in people's intuitions about reasonableness. And the question is, are they going to be respected? And I think the reason why they're not being respected is because religion is kind of aligning with an underlying, um, you know, uh, opposition to or skepticism towards the services in question. And when you read the 125 page draft document, you can see that it's composed by people who aren't so enthusiastic <laughs> about <laughs> contraception independent of the question of religion. And that's what I was trying to put onto the table earlier because of course we know as a society we're divided about these matters. So that's what's in play here. They're tangled up together. Hello, Hamp Watson, just graduated from Emory Law. Um, what is the status of uh, doctors' First Amendment freedoms with respect to laws that require them um, sometimes to say certain things to people who want an abortion? Uh, Julie, there, there is, there's Eighth Amendment law on this, right? I mean, excuse me, Eighth Circuit law on this. There is. <laughs> there is. Um, the, the courts are actually a little bit mixed on it, um, and it hasn't quite gotten to the Supreme Court yet, but there's there's been a lot of cases actually about doctors' First Amendment rights in a variety of contexts, in the abortion contest, context, in the environmental law context, in the LGBT context. One gun, of them is- Gun rights also. Gun rights, thank you, exactly. Well, Schlager um, from the 11th Circuit. Um, so something's gonna get up there eventually, but in abortion it's mixed. So I litigated a case out of North Carolina. We were able to block a law that require doctors to um, give, to display the image of an embryo or fetus to a woman seeking a, an abortion, even if she didn't want to see it, and describe it in detail, even if she didn't want to see it. And one of the most crazy things I've ever seen as a litigator is that the state AG who was defending this law, his theory for defending it was that the woman could wear a blindfold and earmuffs, so she didn't actually have to see or hear. And um, that's why the law was good. It's good constitutional law. <laughs> In any event, we won that case in the Fourth Circuit, actually in front of a pretty conservative panel. We won it 3-0, but- It was Ju Judge Wilkinson, right? Judge Wilkinson wrote the opinion, um, but we lost a similar case in the Fifth Circuit. Um, and then the Eighth Circuit case um, that Linda's talking about is also a very extreme case where um, the doctors had to basically tell women that an embryo is a separate, unique, living human being. I think I'm getting the language right. It was a number of years ago. But so the courts are actually split. And the um, suicidal ideation, Oh, and the too. Su yes, 
Yes, um, and that there was evidence that uh, abortion um, would result in women having suicidal thoughts. So this is the junk science theme again. There's no evidence to support this. Um, and it was something that doctors were forced to do. So it's interesting. One of those cases will eventually get up to the court. But the Eighth Circuit upheld it. Yeah, upheld it, yep. Okay, sure. My name is Ralph DeRose. I'm the general counsel for the Committee of Interns and Residents. We represent intern, resident, and fellow physicians. And I'm wondering what kind of support um, you all are getting in dealing with the arguments about women's health from physician groups. Are they staying out of the fray because this is a hot potato issue? Or um, are you getting support in terms of addressing the evidence-based arguments that you're trying to raise with the legislature and in the courts? Oh, yeah, there were excellent briefs. In whole women's health. Oh, the briefs, but also we might talk about Nancy Stanwood. Or Sorry? Nancy Stanwood. Oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, there's a group called um, Physicians for Reproductive Health, uh, which is currently headed by a wonderful doctor at Yale Medical School, Nancy Stanwood. Um, that has been very active in defending, in, in, in uh, making sure that real medical science is put before courts. And in Whole Woman's Health, there were briefs from uh, all the medical organizations. Yeah, and, right. uh, briefs. And, and Justice Breyer uh, relies on these. In, Quite heavily, all the uh, way through the opinion. In his conclusion that um, the admitting privileges uh, didn't serve any medical purpose and that the uh, uh, necessity to build out the clinics uh, into ambulatory surgical centers was unnecessary, and uh, and he relied a great deal on, uh, on on medical evidence provided by by doctors. Uh, and I would just quickly add that in the advocacy space, um, physicians' reproductive health has been very uh, helpful to all of us in uh, being willing to both do congressional testimony, uh, but also in briefing of staff uh, about the science behind and, and misinformation behind some of the bills that we've seen at the federal level. Uh, and uh, similarly, you know, at the state level, um, ACOG, uh, when we, when I know in CRR and Planned Parenthood and ACLU have challenged these laws, um, having state chapters of doctors uh, file amicus briefs and being willing to testify in those cases is helpful. And you know, as a, as a historical matter, uh, people may not know that the early movement for reform of the old criminal abortion laws came from the public health community. They were out in front uh, before the feminists and before the lawyers. Uh, it was the public health docs uh, who perceived the regime of criminal abortion laws as a public health crisis. Uh, so the doctors have been in there, uh, you know, in a pretty commendable way from the from the beginning. Um, we're very close to being out of time, but I'm, I'm, I feel very remiss that I didn't give people a chance to respond uh, to Reva's very interesting oh, we're out of proposal, time. if anybody has <laughs> anything they want to say. Um, can, I, can I just, um, for one, on the medical community issue, they were key to supporting us in Whole Women's Health, and my colleagues who actually oversaw our amicus effort, Erica and Amy, are here in the audience, and they did an amazing job, and Christine also worked on the case. Um, but the, we really couldn't have done it without the medical community, and if anyone's interested, you should talk to them, because really all of the major mainstream medical organizations came out on our side saying that this was junk science, and it was critical to the decision. And I, I may have mentioned one other thing about Whole Woman's Health. I mean, uh, I, guess it was, uh, I guess it was Julie who said that uh, abortion is very safe. One reason it's very safe in Texas, I mean extremely safe, is that Texas did have uh, extensive regulation of, of abortion. It's not as if it was unregulated. It was just regulated like any other medical service and, and done very effectively. So Texas saying, you know, we need this new law uh, to protect women. Women were perfectly well protected by the existing maternal, regulatory framework. It was the maternal mortality numbers in Texas. It was pregnancy that was not safe. I mean, uh, not to scare people, but there was a very strange way in which the case was litigated and which- you know, I think it was, I think the ultimate statistic was that it was 100 times more dangerous to give birth in the state of Texas than to have an abortion. But yeah. it had the worst numbers in the United States. And so what they did was go after shutting down access to abortion which was safe, and, as, and they cut the health care services for pregnant women. Yeah, the, and that information just never came in. The, this is the, the frame issue. That so everyone focused on the sort of abortion silo, and they l l missed the larger frame, so that not only were from the outcome numbers, the maternal mortality numbers were through the wor roof, worse than anywhere in the United States and beyond, and at the same time, the state was cutting health care access. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's a typical war and 
Okay, there's a big red sign that was held up that said stop. But before you go, you have to listen to this. A plenary panel, a plenary panel titled Progressive Federalism, A New Way Forward, that is chaired, I think, by our new law school dean, Heather Gerken, who's very good. Uh, begins immediately after this panel in presidential ballroom. Volunteers will be on site to help direct you there. Actually, it's right down the hall. 